BT Church, good morning. How are we doing? It's good to see you guys today. Yeah, y'all can clap it up if you want to get excited for the word. Come on. If you have a Bible with you, I pray that you do. Uh, open up to the book of Exodus. Also, if you have a seat next to you, amen, go ahead and scoot in. We still got some people, I believe, uh, looking for a seat. Uh, man, grateful uh, just for what God is doing here at BT. Uh, if we haven't met yet, my name is Danny. I get to serve here as our online and young adults pastor. Uh, shout out Church Online. So grateful that you are here with us today. Uh, and also, man, like God is doing some really cool stuff uh, in, in the lives of our young adults. So shameless plug. If you are 18 to 29 years old, come hang out with us on Tuesday night at 7 p.m. in our student complex. Uh, if you are not 18 to 29 years old, amen, come hang out with us anyway because we need dream teamers, right? Come on, come serve. We'd love to have you and have you uh, share your wisdom with our young adults. Uh, but we are a culture uh, of celebration. Uh, if you've been a part of BT for a while, you know this. If, if you're, maybe you're kind of like still uh, hanging out with us uh, for a couple of weeks and you're, you're just kind of getting into uh, BT Church, uh, know that we love to celebrate the work that God is doing. Uh, BT is five different physical campuses in our online campus and also so many ministries represented within those campuses. And so maybe you're tied into what's, what's going on here at McAllen, but you have no idea what's happening in other campuses. So we love to celebrate the work that God is doing uh, just across our, our ministries and campuses. And so, so as we celebrate, I, I want you to help us celebrate together uh, as 39 people have said yes to Jesus already this year who have crossed the line from death to life, who have given their life over to Jesus. And of those 39, we've seen 18 people take their next step through baptism. We got to celebrate five earlier, as Pastor Isado mentioned. So we're just seeing God do some really cool stuff and, and we are believing and trusting that he's like nowhere near being done yet uh, and, and, and we believe that all of this is simply a work of God, right? That, that this is not because how amazing our worship team is. They are amazing, amen. I love to worship with them every Sunday uh, but this is just God uh, showing up as we continue to be faithful and practice obedience towards him uh, and so I love uh, getting to see what's happening across all of our ministries uh, and we're believing that God's going to move again this morning and I pray that you are believing that for your life as well. Uh, so we've been in a series called The Trellis and the Vine. Uh, we are now in week five of the series. And this series is all about rethinking resolutions and pursuing a rule of life. Uh, like what does it mean to center our daily, our weekly, our monthly, our annual lives around the person of Jesus and looking at rhythms over resolutions. So uh, obviously at the beginning of the year, people, what do they do? They set goals. They set resolutions. We're now in February, so that means one of two things. One, you already forgot about your goals, amen, right? Uh, or two, you're like, January was like a free month. I'm starting in February, right? Let's do this, right? And so you're in one of those worlds. I have no idea which one. Uh, but but our, our hope is that we would uh, just look at what it means to pursue rhythms, right? And we'll talk more about that today of, uh, of looking at the life of Jesus and how he pursues rhythms. But, like, we know that goals are good, right? Goals kind of bring motivation. I, I get a lot of motivation when I set goals. It doesn't mean I, I, I do the goal. I just, I just love setting them, right? Amen. That's, like, the best thing to do. But I'm going to practice some accountability. So y'all help me out. So I have a goal for myself. So y'all can check up on me, like, in December, right? Uh, and the goal is this. It's a physical goal of exercise. And my goal this year at some point, I don't know when, is to run a half marathon. All right, anybody with me? Nobody wants to run? Okay, cool. That's all good. I'm joking. Uh, but some of you are like, bro, like, do a marathon. Like, no, right? Like, I, I know my limits too, right? Uh, some of you are like, that's it, right? And so I'll, let me see how much you run, right? Uh, but for me personally, I was like, I used to run in high school. It's been a minute since I've been in high school, uh, so my body's a little different. It hurts a little more. Uh, but I'm going to try this out, right? Uh, so that's accountability, right? Amen. But rather than setting goals, what if we looked at rhythms uh, of every day doing some habitual practices that center our lives around Jesus? And that's what this entire series is all about. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't want us to, to be afraid of looking at this phrase, rule of life, because uh, it sounds very ancient and churchy. Uh, and the reality is it is, right? Because this is something that our, our ancient brothers and sisters uh, used to develop rhythms to put in place in their life to grow in intimacy with their relationship with God, right? And so this is something that we're going after. And a rule of life, it, it's simply about organizing your life around practices to orient ourselves around the person of Jesus. So you're choosing spiritual disciplines, prayer, silence, solitude, scripture reading, fasting, all these different things that we see Jesus doing 
uh, really applying those to our life and then developing some rhythms and practices towards going after it. So it's about looking at and adopting the lifestyle of Jesus. When you look at Jesus, right, if you ever read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are the biography stories of Jesus, right? They lay out the life of what Jesus looks like from his birth all the way to his resurrection, right? And so when you look at the stories of Jesus, he had some rhythms. Like he did the same things over and over and over, right? He would go to a town, he would go to the synagogue, right, the religious the organization, and he would teach, right? And he would teach and people would get astonished at his teaching. And then he would heal people. And then people would get astonished at the way that he healed people. The religious leaders would get upset, right? They started arguing back and forth with Jesus. And Jesus would heal. The crowds would come after him because they want to see what he's going to do next and hear what he's going to say next. And as the crowds grow bigger and bigger, what does he do? He goes away and withdraws, right, and goes to find a place of prayer in a deserted place, right? You see this rhythm over and over and over. And then he comes back. People are like, Jesus, where you been, bro? We're looking for you. And then he's like, let's go to the next town. And then he does it again. And then he does it again, right? It's this rhythm of his life that he orients his life around. So simply put, to kind of bring this theme of rule of life into like a modern phrase, a rule of life is simply a plan to follow Jesus. Like, like you're just planning it out. You're mapping it out. This is something we already do, right? Like if you have a financial goal, what are you going to do? You're going to plan it out, right? Like we're not just going to hope that one day our bank account's going to be full, amen, right, that'd be awesome, right. But if you have like a goal like, okay, I want, I want to buy a home, I'm tired of renting, I want to purchase a home now, right, then you're going to set a plan to put money aside every month rather than going to, you know, Chili's every Friday night, right. And so you're going to set a plan to put aside specific amounts to get you towards a goal, right. Same thing with exercise. If you have a physical goal you want to go after, you're not just going to hope that one day your body's going to look amazing, right, that'd be awesome. It doesn't work that way though, right. What do you do? Okay, I'm going to get a gym membership. I'm going to pay way too much money and provide to the Gold's Gym Retirement Fund. That's what I do. Amen, right? But then you can decide, all right, four to five days a week, right, I'm going to go and go to the gym. And then some of you guys, like, you go above and beyond that where you're like, you know what, Monday, chest day, right, Tuesday, back day, Wednesday, leg day. So, like, you know what you're going to work out when you even get into the gym, right? You're developing a plan, right, to be able to go after a goal or a rhythm that you want to follow. So the reality is this. We know how to operate within a rule of life. Like you are already doing that. But the question I have for us today is this. Is, is your rule of life oriented around the person of Jesus Christ? Like, like how are we operating our lives and rhythms to where it's centered around Jesus? And that's the challenge of this entire series of looking at and developing a rule of life and pursuing rhythms over resolutions. If you guys missed any of the messages, like I said, we're in week five. You can go to our website, bt.church slash teachings. We also have an amazing resource page for you called bt.church slash rule of life. And on there, there's books, podcasts, workbooks, a bunch of different resources that you can access uh, just to help develop this as the year goes on. Because we want to help see and, and help you journey in your relationship with Jesus, knowing that it's not just a one-time decision. Exodus chapter 20, let's get it. I'm going to read about 17 verses. I'm going to pray. We're going to talk about it. We're going to see what God does. I'm excited for today. Starting in verse 1, says this. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Do not have any other gods besides me. Do not make an idol for yourself. Whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow and worship to them or do not serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for their father's iniquity to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But showing faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Because the Lord will not leave anyone unpunished who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You are to labor six days and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do any work, you, your son or daughter, your male or female servant, your livestock or the resident alien who is within your city gates. For the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything in them in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and declared it holy. Honor your father and mother so that you may have a long life in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. 
Do not steal. Do not give false testimony against your neighbor. Do not covet your neighbor's house. Do not covet your neighbor's wife, his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. Thank you for this morning, for gathering us together to worship God, for uh, worshiping through giving and through the reminder of the sacrifice that Jesus made through the Lord's Supper, God. So I just pray uh, that you would speak powerfully to every single one of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, I'm real big on stats. I love looking at just like like how people analyze culture and stuff. And so I saw a stat one time that said this, uh, that you forget everything you hear, but you remember everything you write down because you can go read it later. So in that sense, I want everybody to take out your pen and your notebook and write down some notes. Amen. And here's our sermon title for today. The Discipline of Denial. The Discipline of Denial. Growing up as a kid in elementary and really all throughout high school, uh, here's, here's how I kind of operated. If I was told, and some of y'all might be with me on this. If not, then pray for me. If I was told not to do something, you already know where I'm going with this, right? Like, you know what, you know what I did? I did the thing that I was told not to do, right? Like in school, right? If I was told, like, hey, you can't do this. I mean, why are you going to tell a kid not to press a red button, right? No, we're going to press a red button. Amen, right? Hopefully somebody else is with me. But I'm definitely that kid that when I run into, like, an old teacher from high school or middle school, like, a target or something, and they're like, hey, like, what are you doing with your life? Oh, I'm a pastor at BT. Like, you're a pastor? <laughs> yes, I am, right? Thank you for believing in me, right? Uh, Mr. Abba, I was right there, bro. He was, he was my teacher, and he knows that, right? He's like, you're a pastor? You didn't even turn in your homework. I know, right? <laughs> And I was a kid in elementary that I broke every rule, right? And, and I just found out right now that elementary, some elementary teachers still do this. But this is what I had to do. When I got in trouble, they put me in the corner of the room with a pen or a pencil and a notebook. And I did what? I will not blank 500 times, right? Over and over and over. And, I mean, I don't think it worked because I still broke the rules, right? But <laughs> and then it got worse. Like, I would also think that, like, if I got in trouble in school, like, my parents would never find out. Your parents always find out, right? It's just like, like, it happened 20 minutes ago. How do you even know that already? It's crazy. Like, this is, this is insane. But also, like, I just had the worst luck. Like, in elementary, all of my elementary teachers, they went to the place that my mom worked because they love shopping there. So I'm like, God, I can't catch a break, right? And so here's the thing. Anyone else like to follow rules, right? Like, by the way, you drive down Trenton. I know you don't like following rules, right? Uh, just joking, right? Some of y'all are like, I feel convicted. But, but here's the thing. When rules are set in place without us understanding why they're there, we have zero passion, I think, for following them or even trying to understand them, right? Like like if a rule is set in place and we don't know why it's there, we just are told we have to do this, then we have zero passion for wanting to go after that. We just read right now what's commonly known as the Ten Commandments. For so many of you, you've heard these since you're a little kid, you even have them memorized. For somebody in this room, maybe this is your first time you're even hearing these commandments, right? But, but we, we, we just read the Ten Commandments and maybe you're thinking, man, like what we just read, that's a lot of do nots, right? Is there anything I can do, right? And when it comes to practicing a rule of life, we're talking about this theme of the discipline of denial, which is a fun one to talk about, and I'll tell you why. Because it's basically me reminding all of us that none of us are there yet, right? While living in a culture that teaches us to affirm what we feel rather than deny ourselves, right? So pray for me as I do this because it's going to be crazy, right? I'm basically telling you, like, you guys are wrong, and me too, amen, right? Because we have to deny ourselves. And and I have this question that I want to answer today, is that when it comes to denial, like the denial of ourself, can that ever become delight? Like, is it ever a delight to deny ourselves, right? And looking at the question of why do we have to deny ourselves? Because there's this reality of something called sin. That at one moment, we became disobedient towards God. And a holy God separated because of us, of our sin. And the only thing that can fix that separation is the person and finished work of Jesus Christ, right? So we have to deny ourselves so that we can have a relationship with God. And a holy God, to relate to his people, put parameters in place so that he can relate to them as their God. So here's the thing. We just read the Ten Commandments, right? A list of rules and guidelines that God gave to Moses to give to his people, right? 
But something powerful happens in verse 2. So I want you to go back to verse 2 with me. Because like I said, if we don't understand the why of something, then we're not going to care about the what of what it is. right? If we don't understand why these rules are in place, we're not really going to care about the what of these rules. So look at verse 2. God spoke all these words, which is powerful in itself. But then verse 2 says this. I am the Lord your God, who what? Brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. And so here's the thing that I want you to get. Because maybe you're like reading the Ten Commandments and you're like, yeah, I don't, I don't dig any of this, right? But here's the thing. Before God gave them the set of rules to follow, God reminds them of how he rescued them, right? Before God gave them a list of rules, and there's also like 500 other commandments if you just keep reading. But here's the thing. Before God gave them these rules, he reminds them of how he rescued them. God didn't just pull up one day to this random group of people and was like, hey, listen up. I got some rules for you guys. You better listen, right? No. What does he do? This is a quote by a theologian, Christopher Wright, says this. God acted first. He redeemed them out of their bondage and then made his covenant with them, a covenant which on their side was to keep God's law as a response to grateful obedience to their saving God. So what did God do? There's a people in desperate need of help, the Israelites, right? So let me backtrack a little bit, okay, to the beginning of the book of Exodus is that you have this group of people, the Israelites. They, in the Old Testament, were God's chosen people. What were they chosen for? They were chosen to reflect and represent God to the world around them, okay? If you've ever read the Old Testament, you know that a lot of times they did a really bad job of that, right? But here's the thing, so do we, right? Amen, praise God. So we can't give them a hard time, right? And so they were chosen as God's chosen people to represent and reflect them, right? And then what happened is they got taken over by the Egyptians. And for 400 years, 400 years, they were held as slaves in slavery and bondage to the Egyptians, right? And they start crying out to God. And then God calls this guy named Moses, right, through the form of a talking bush that's on fire. And somehow it's not burning down. And Moses is like, what's happening here? And God says, hey, I want you to be the one to go and rescue the Israelites, right? So go and be my voice to these people and help them get out of slavery. So Moses, after fighting with God, finally does it. And and he has to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. Pharaoh says no a bunch of times. Ten plagues. Pharaoh finally releases them, and they go up onto the Red Sea, and when they get to the Red Sea, they see a huge body of water and an army coming after them, and they're stuck in the middle. They're like, what are we going to do now? What does God do? Moses, throw your staff on the ground. Boom, throws the staff on the ground. The water parts, and they walk right over the sea, right? Water comes back, and the army, the Egyptian army is then destroyed, right? What did God do? God rescued them from the Egyptians after being held bondage as slaves, So now what God wants them to do is say, hey, now you're going to represent and reflect me to the world around. And here's how you're going to relate to me. A holy God, right? Here's some rules and guidelines and parameters that I have set in place. So I believe that God gave them these things for two reasons. To be in relation with the holy God, but also to represent a holy God to an unholy culture, right? So giving these commandments was a a result of God working in and through his people that he called to himself out of slavery, out of oppression, right, and now teaching them how can you reflect me. And here's the thing. Our job as believers of Jesus is the same thing. So if you're in this room and you have made a declaration to follow Jesus, you've entered into the baptism waters, right, we're going to see more people do that today. Amen. But here's what's going to happen. As you place your faith in Jesus, our job in this world now is, is to represent and reflect Jesus to the world around us, right? Judges chapter 2, verse 10 is one of the most saddest moments of Scripture for me. If you ever heard me preach, you probably heard me say this verse, because I love to remind people of this. Israelites, what was their job? Represent and reflect God to an ungodly culture. And in Judges chapter 2, verse 10, it says this, that there arose another generation that did not know the Lord. You know why that happened? Because a group of people chose not to represent and reflect him, right? And my prayer for us is this, is that w- that would never be said about our generation, right? Because we would be a generation that, is, that is, feels the call to represent and reflect Jesus and understand that and live that out, right? And, and what I love about BT is this, is that the work that we're getting to see God do here, we get to celebrate every single Sunday of life change and baptisms. Like, it's beautiful to see this. But one thing we have to understand is this, Psalm chapter 102 is that the work that we're doing is not just for us, 
but for the generation that's coming after us. That for people who are not even yet created are one day going to praise the Lord. That 50 years down the road, that 100 years down the road, we're going to see more and more people being a part of BT Church and living out the gospel, right, spreading out the gospel because of the call to represent and reflect Jesus to the world around us. That's what we're going to be able to see. And that's my prayer for our generation. That's why I love working with young adults to help them figure out their relationship with Jesus so they can live out their relationship with Jesus. Because we are called to reflect and represent him, right? That's what God called the Israelites to do. Some of you guys know part of our story is that we got to uh, do a lot of work and uh, work in New York City. And part of the projects that we would do, like part of the different like mission projects that we would do when we go and serve the area. Uh, if you didn't know, my wife and I, we helped plant a church in New York. But here's the thing. Uh, when we would go serve people, uh, we, we would try to do very, very simple things to give somebody something so they can hopefully remember us later, right? Because if you know anything about New York City, they walk like this, like New York speed. Like the way you guys drive down Trenton, that's how they walk on the sidewalk, right? And so it's, it's New York speed, like get out of the way, right? Amen, right? So they don't have a whole lot of time to just like, like oh, yeah, let's have a chat, right? No, like if somebody's doing that, they probably don't have a job, right? And so okay, they're just chilling, right? And so our job was like, all right, let's give them something, something tangible, a uh, free cup of coffee, a free lemonade. Let's give them a church card. Hopefully they remember us, right? And so we would set up like little stations in very high traffic areas, right, like very high walking areas, so like subway stops. And so one day we're out there doing a, a little service project. We had a table with a big gallon or a five-gallon jug of coffee, and we're just giving out free coffee. And some people would ask, why are you doing this? And our response was always the same. This is a small way, free, which free in New York often, often meant scam, right? So, like, nothing's free, right? So you have to, like, like, really be careful, right? This is a small way to show you that Jesus loves you. Like, that's what we would tell them. Like, oh, cool. Some people would be like, all right, cool. Like, I'm good. Like, thank you. Some people were like, oh, free cup of coffee. Yeah, I'll take some sugar, everything. Give me a church card. Cool, right? And that was normally the response. One time, true story, we're, at, we're all set up at a subway stop giving away a free cup of coffee, right? Some lady comes up and says, hey, why are you guys doing this? Like, she seemed like a really nice lady. So I say my, my praise. This is a small way to show you that Jesus loves you, right? And she does this. She goes, nope, nope. And she starts walking away. And when New Yorkers walk away and they keep talking, they start screaming like, nope, nope, right? Because they want you to hear them, right? And then she says this, you made Trump happen. I was <laughs> me? Like, <laughs> I didn't know I was that powerful, right? That's cool, I guess, right? And I was like, what? And then she just walked away. I never saw her again, right? And I was like, man, that's crazy. As, as, as I started reflecting on that, um, I don't want I'm not getting into politics here. I'm going to let Pastor Chris do that. Amen. <laughs> but here's the thing. When she said that to me, after me saying, this is a small way to show you that Jesus loves you. So in her mind, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm reflecting Jesus, right? But her automatic response was tied to a political party, not to a savior. And, and, and so here's the thing I want you to understand. Our job is to reflect Jesus. So whenever we are doing something to reflect anything else outside of Jesus, any political affiliation, whatever the side, whatever side you're on, or, or any social trend or any uh, justice thing that's happening in our culture, if other people see that as an automatic response to our belief and faith in Jesus, then in my opinion, we haven't properly reflected Jesus. And so my hope is that we would be people to reflect Jesus. And that's what I want for us. But here's how we do that. We have to deny ourselves, and we have to look at the parameters that God has given us because God is literally giving us a playbook of how to do it. And going back to my original question, if, if we're stuck in this culture and world of self-affirmation rather than self-denial, then we're going to be blinded to see how God desire, desires us for, to live our lives and how can denial then become delight, right? And, and there's two things I want to say. Here's the first thing. So w when denial becomes delight... This is how it can happen. When we deny ourselves for God's glory. When we understand that this is not about us but about him. And we're denying ourselves to elevate the glory of God. Then I believe our denial can then become delight. So, so look at the first couple of commandments. Because if, if you ever noticed this or maybe you have before, maybe you have no idea. The first couple of commandments, like the first four, 
what they do is they help us understand our relationship to God, right? And then the other half of the commandments we'll get to in a little bit, they help us understand how we relate to then each other, right? And so in the first couple of commandments, you have this, don't have any other gods before me. Don't make an idol for yourself. Don't misuse the name of God and remember the Sabbath, right? And so how does denying ourselves following these commandments, these rules that God has given us, give God the glory? I think this, because you go back to verse 2 of the why of what God is doing. And what does he say? I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I brought you out of slavery, right, out of the place of slavery. When we start to deny ourselves and follow the parameters that God has set in place, what we're doing is we're identifying ourselves with our rescuer. Consider what Jesus did for us on the cross. He rescued us, right, from sin and death forever by our faith in him. Israelites were slaves in Egypt and God provided a way out right? Us, slaves to our sin, and God provided a way out through the person and work of Jesus, right? So when we place our faith in Jesus, it affects our eternity. Our lives are forever changed, right? But it also affects our right now of how we live our life here today. I truly think this. Two words that Jesus said change the course of history. Those two words are follow me. Jesus went to a group of people who were living their lives, fishing, collecting taxes, just doing normal everyday things, right? And he says, hey, come follow me, right? Follow me. Now, church history says this, that when a rabbi would call someone to follow them, the person that's doing the following would then adapt to their rhythms and patterns of life, right? What did we talk about at the beginning? Rule of life. So they would adapt to their rule of life. They would do the things that that person that they're following was then doing. They would physically walk with them from town to town, listening and watching what they're doing, right? And it also says this, that they were so close and following after him that you almost couldn't even tell the difference, right? Because you were reflecting what you follow. You ever notice that, that people reflect what they follow, right? Like next Sunday, second best Sunday of the year, right? First best Sunday, Easter, right? Come to Easter service, amen, right? Second best Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday, right? (laughs) You guys are not excited because the Cowboys are out, but it happens every year. So just get over it and enjoy the game, right? (laughs) I love football. If my team is in it or not, I'm going to watch it. It's great, right? But next Sunday, here's what's going to happen. You're going to see some 49ers jerseys in the room, and you're going to see some Chiefs jerseys in the room, right? Right? 49ers fans. I know know y'all be walking in little Kittle jerseys. I see it, right? And so you're reflecting what you follow. If you follow that team, you're going to put that jersey on, so you're going to reflect it, right? But here's the thing. Bandwagons is not the same as committed follower, amen, right? So all the Swifties out there, you had no idea who the Chiefs even were (laughs) until a couple of months ago. I'm not afraid to say it, right? It's okay. Some of you Chiefs fans are, like, real, but I don't know. You reflect what you follow, right? So one thing we have to understand is that the moment that we place our faith in Jesus, we're now identifying ourselves with the person who rescued us. And so when Jesus becomes our Savior, here's the thing that a lot of people really don't like, is that he also becomes our Lord. Meaning this, now we have to deny ourselves and allow God to be the ones to direct our lives. That's what it means to follow after him. That's what we're we're talking about, pursuing a rule of life to help us deny elements of our life so that we can wholeheartedly go after him, right? So God is the one who provides a redemption like he did for the Israelites. He rescued them out of slavery in the ways that Jesus rescued them out of sin, uh, rescues us out of sin. And so it means that he gets to be the ones who direct our lives. As believers of Jesus, God's glory ought to be our greatest desire, but the only way we can do that is through self-denial. It's to literally get over ourselves, right? Someone who did this so well, one of my favorite characters in the Bible, is a guy named John the Baptist. I love John the Baptist. We get like just a little bit about him. We don't get a whole lot about him. But John the Baptist, he understood his purpose in this life. That he was one called to prepare the way of the Lord, right? In our culture, I feel like it's so tempting, especially in our Western culture, to build up our own name, build up our own platform, build up our own status, right? And here in John the Baptist, we have someone who did the complete opposite of that. John chapter 1, verse 29, uh, going to 34, says this. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said this, look. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I told you about. 
After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. I didn't know him, but I came baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. As John testified, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and he rested on him. I didn't know him, but he sent me to baptize with water, told me that the one you see the spirit descending and resting on, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testified that this is the son of God, right? And so here's the thing with John the Baptist is that as he's doing work, he's doing ministry, people start following him. So he has disciples that are now following him. He has his posse, his group of people that follow after him. He's a leader, right? But the moment that he sees Jesus, he tells his followers, that's Jesus. That's the one I've been telling you about. That's the one I've been preparing you for. Go get him, right? And the thing about John the Baptist is he wasn't trying to build up his own platform. He was just preparing people for Jesus. And I think that's what we get to do in this world. That rather than building up ourselves or thinking about our name or our status, we, our job, represent, reflect Jesus, and just point people to him, right? And that's what John the Baptist did so well. And he does this by simply self-denial so he could bring glory to God. Just consider what the commandments say. Do not have any other gods before me. So through the practice of self-denial, whenever we have no other gods, then God is presented. And God is put on the platform over anything else. Do not make an idol for yourself, right? Whenever we don't choose to worship another idol, then God is in worship, right? Think about how powerful this is because this affected everything else, right? That when you get to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 3, one of my favorite moments of scripture, you have these three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Right? And they're living in an area that's not their own. They're exiled. So the leader at the time, King Nebuchadnezzar, what does he do? He makes this gigantic golden statue. And what does he tell people? Worship that. That can't do anything, right? <laughs> so there's nothing it can do. But he says this. When you hear the music play, right, the trumpets, the lyre, everything, when you hear the music play, everybody has to bow down and worship the statue that he has created. Three people don't do it. Who? Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Why? Because they heard God say it here. Do not have any other gods. Do not create an idol for yourself. Especially don't worship that idol. So they knew that in their minds. But they didn't just know it. They lived it out. They knew that as believers of God, their job was to reflect and represent God in an unholy culture. So whenever the king, the person and position of authority is telling everybody else to worship that golden statue, what do they say? We're not going to do that. And what was the threat if you don't worship this you are going to be thrown into the fire. I love this moment because, you know, you have like the other people in, in the culture that are like start tattletelling. They're like, hey, like those three guys are not doing it, right? Like don't be a tattletale, people. Come on, right? So the king like almost doesn't believe him. He's like, okay, like, well, then bring him over here. Like let's give him a second chance. Play the music. And then they don't do it. And so we're not going to worship that, right? Our God can rescue us from that. But even if he doesn't, right, like that's the faith that they have. And it's crazy because in this moment, they get thrown into the fire. Nothing happens to them. God protects them. You know what King Nebuchadnezzar does? He takes them out of the fire. They're unharmed. He says, praise to your God. Like the fact that they were willing to stand in culture whenever culture was pushing back and be willing to be the ones to reflect and represent God in that culture, it showed the king who God was, right? We never know the effect of what will happen whenever we choose to practice obedience towards God and reflect God to the world around us. We see Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego do the same thing. God's name is then properly displayed, right? Don't misuse the name of God, right? And then this one, the Sabbath, that's a crazy one. I feel like this is the one in our Western culture that's often ignored, right? We're like, don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery. I can do those things. But like, don't work. Like, you know how, how terrible my backyard is, right? That's how we are right now, my wife and I. It's terrible. Here's the thing. The Sabbath. I think about the reality of, of how this commandment is displayed, right? Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, right? A lot of do nots. This one you do, right? Don't have any other God. Don't make a, you know, an idol and worship it. Don't steal. Don't commit. A lot of do nots. Remember the Sabbath. And I feel like this is one of the hardest ones for our Western culture to understand because we are a culture of production. And we feel like that, that we, as we produce, then, then we, we receive more, obviously, right, is how we think. 
And it's crazy to think about the Sabbath because in the list of the Ten Commandments, this one gets like the most publicity, right? Like everything else is like don't do this, one verse, don't do this, one verse. The Sabbath is four verses long, right? And, and God starts to like, like helping them remember of what happened at the creation story in the book of Genesis and why the Sabbath is holy, that God worked and labored for six days. But on the seventh day he rested, so you rest as well, right? And he's reminding them over and over and over what the Sabbath is. And I started to think, why, did, why is this one like, like, like described in the most way than compared to the other commandments? I think this. The Israelites just came off of what? 400 years of working every single day. 400 years of oppression and slavery. All they knew was work, right? And, and now you might be thinking like, well, yeah, like if I had the freedom to do something, then of course I'm not going to want to do that thing that I used to be stuck in anymore, right? But here's the thing. I, I just think this. When we're so stuck in something, even if it's a bad thing, we just get so comfortable there. And that's what we're used to. So we're afraid to get out of it, Right? And so God is like, remember the Sabbath because of how you worked, right? And, and so in, in practicing the Sabbath, here's the thing. When you're stuck in something for so long that something just becomes comfortable, it's what you know. And so God was trying to help rewire their minds to help them understand that we can find delight in him and not just in what we try to produce, right? And so the Sabbath is literally trusting God to pause from work to reflect on the one who provides the work for us, right? It's a literal 24-hour period where we do not work. It's the ultimate self-denial, in my opinion, because it's literally designed to get our minds off of ourselves and our work and onto our Savior. Pastor Rich Viotis in Queens, New York says this, if you can't stop work for 24 hours, it's an indication of your slavery. And here's what God was trying to do. I just rescued you from slavery. I don't want you to go into another form of slavery, right? It's crazy. My wife and I, we've been uh, talking a little bit about how we can honor and practice the Sabbath. And so we've been putting the different little practices in place. And here's one thing that I learned about myself. Like, anytime I want to practice something, like, if it's not perfect from day one, I don't want to do it, right? So I'm like, just like, it's not going to be perfect, just try it, right? And what I realized is one of the hardest things about practicing the Sabbath is preparing for the Sabbath, right? Because you have to do a lot of work to get it ready, right? If you ever study the Sabbath, like, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And, but literally, like, like, don't work, right? Like in, in, the, in, in church history, the ways that the Jews would practice the Sabbath, and they still do it now, is they would even consider what lamps do I want on tomorrow that I could just turn on right now so I don't have to do the work of turning on the lamp, right? Like straight up preparation. It's crazy. Like go buy all your groceries, cook all your food Friday night so that Saturday you're not cooking anything, right, because you're not working, right? And so uh, one day as I'm like, like helping, like saying, hey, we need to practice the Sabbath, right? Like let's do this. Uh, our bedroom is full of clean clothes all over the floor, right? Amen, right? You know that like meme where it's like it takes an hour to wash your clothes but five to seven business days to put them away, right? That's <laughs> our house, right? So it's like do we put them away or do we just like put them on, right? So, um, so yeah. And, and so Friday night, what did we not do? We didn't put up our clothes, right? So Saturday morning we wake up. And, and my, like my, my peace world is like wake up, coffee, Bible, prayer, peace, lo-fi music. If you know what that is in the background. If you don't, just Google it. It will change your life, right? And, and that's just my, 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 my Saturday morning. I love that, right? But then there's clothes everywhere. So what do we start doing? Putting up the clothes. And I was like, whoa, we're not working today, right? And we're like, well, the, the bedroom's dirty. Like, yeah, I know. Let's just leave it dirty. It's okay. <laughs> God's going to honor this moment. I truly believe this, right? And so we're like, let's just do it tomorrow, right? Amen. But it's like, like doing the things that don't bring delight, right? And, and it, the practice of Sabbath is a way to say, God, I'm just denying what maybe I feel right now and denying the work I want to do so I can just simply de delight in you. So how does denial become delight when we deny ourselves for God's glory? And here's the second one. How does denial become delight? When we deny ourselves for the good of others, right? And, and so the first couple of commandments, it's how we relate to God. And the second half of the commandments is in how we relate to other people. Like it's a good thing to, to not murder someone. It's a good thing to not steal, to not commit adultery, to not want to take something that isn't yours that your neighbor has, right? And he goes through all this list of stuff, right? So how does denial become uh Denial of self become delight is when we, when we initially deny ourselves, our minds and hearts uh, are attentive to who God is. So then we're delighting in God, which then will naturally flow into serving and loving other people, right? And will flow to 
a lack of desire to want what they have and what we don't have, right? I think the reason why we are desired and tempted to do other things and, and to maybe have what other people don't have uh, is something I, I just like to call the temptation of comparison. Social media is great. I love social media. Addicted, not ashamed. Amen. But here's the thing. What's the danger of social media is comparison because everybody posts the best things that they have, right? So you're like, well, I don't have that. I should buy it. So now you're spending money, right? And so then you go down to that rabbit trail. Then you mess up your financial goals back from the beginning, right? And you start comparing and you start getting envious and jealous of what other people have and what you don't have. Or even like looking at what other people don't have, right? And our denial becomes good towards other people when we can truly see people for who they are rather than what they have. Or what they don't have, right? Somebody of poverty. Seeing them for who they are rather than what they don't have. Because I think what happens, especially in our Western mindset, is when we look at people, we get to meet people, is we do an automatic, like, check. Like, is this person going to bring value to me or not, right? And that's how we, like, identify people, right? That's why we ask the question when we meet somebody, what do you do? Because maybe what you do can help me get to where I want to go, right? But what if we can truly see people for who they are rather than what they have? I know this is not just true for me, so y'all help me out here. How many of you had that best friend growing up that you know you were their friend because of what they had? Let me tell you what I mean. They had a pool and you didn't. And you're like, mom, I'm going to my friend's house. Pack my swimsuit, right? We don't have a pool, right? They do, right? Or, or, like, or they have that new game system and you don't have that yet, right? You're like, mom, I'm going to go over there, right? I'll be back tomorrow because we'll be up all night playing this game, right? That was me. I had so many friends that they had stuff that I didn't have. So I'm like, I'm going to go hang out with them, right? What I love about Jesus is that he sees people so differently. Jesus, text out, he doesn't see people for who they were but for who they could become. That's why he hangs out with Zacchaeus. When no one else wanted to. Zacchaeus, come down for the tree, bro. Let's go to your house. Let's have some dinner. Zacchaeus' life is transformed. Jesus sees people based on not what they, like their possessions, but just for the person that they could become. That's why I think this. When he calls Peter to follow him, he doesn't say, hey, bring your fishing rod. Because you're a really good fisherman. So that, that way, like, when we get hungry, you can throw, you throw that rod out right now. Leave your stuff. Come follow me, right? Like Matthew, tax collector, you're really good with money. Even though you'd be stealing people from people, but you're really good, I guess. Like, bring your money. No, like, that's not why he calls Matthew, because he's really good at something or for what they possess. He simply calls them to himself, right? Focusing on people's possessions, they create jealousy and envy, and they harm relationships because we're so focused on what we don't have and maybe what they have. We're talking about developing a rule of life rhythms and practices that you can implement in your life. So here's a challenge I want to present to you. A rule of life is about doing something habitually every day, every week, every month, annually, right? And so here's a simple rule of life challenge that I want to give to you. Some of you, you might do this already, so just keep doing it. But if you don't, try this out. Every morning this week for five minutes, take a pen or your notes on your phone and just write down and reflect the things that you are grateful for that God has provided for you. So we can simply get our minds on what we don't have. Like renew your mind by way of reflecting on how God is ready. And, and start with the smallest things to the biggest things. God, I'm, I'm grateful that I have electricity in this house. Like something like, you know, your electricity bill, like it comes out like, you know, automatically from your debit card so you don't even realize you pay it. And you're paying like way too much money. Amen. But it's like it's giving you a, a light for that lamp to be able to, you open up your Bible so you can read it right at night or in the morning. God, I'm thankful for this electricity bill, God. God, I'm thankful that I have food in my fridge. And just start writing down the things that you are thankful for, right? Because when we're able to see people in the way to, that Jesus sees people, we go from denial to delight for God's glory and for the good of other people, right? So now we can relate to them and simply say, man, like I see you. Not for what you have, not for what you can do for me, but simply because I want to help you follow Jesus. How do we do this? How do we deny ourselves and why do we have to? I want to close with this verse. Luke chapter 9 verse 23. To me it's one of the most challenging verses in the entire scripture. It says this. Then he said to them all, Jesus is talking, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him what? Deny himself. There it is. 
take up his cross daily, daily, rhythm of life, right, rule of life every day, and then come follow me, right? Man, there's a lot of things I love about Jesus, but this is one of my favorite things about Jesus. Jesus came on the greatest rescue mission of all time. To seek and save the lost. Like you would think that for somebody who came on that kind of mission wants to be like the biggest influencer of all time. Like give me the biggest following, like all that stuff, right? Give me the most amount of people so I can share this message. And as Jesus went from town to town doing the things that God was calling him to do and saying and the way he was teaching, the way he was healing people, what happened naturally is crowds of people started coming around him. And then following him from town to town. But if you notice this about Jesus, it's kind of crazy. That as the crowds got bigger, Jesus would say like the wildest stuff. It's like, oh, you want to follow me? Like, well, you, you do know that like we don't have a house, right? Oh, you want to follow me? Like, like, leave all your stuff, right? And so in this moment, in Luke chapter 9, he has this crowds of people following after him, right? And also think back like the story of feeding of the 5,000. They're all looking for him. After the, the miracle, and, and he's like, you're not looking for me because of me. You're looking for me because of what I did for you, right? Like, he's not afraid to be straight with people, right? And here in Luke chapter 9, he has this crowd of people around him. And it's almost like he stops. He turns around. He's like, if you guys really want to follow me, here's what you have to do. You are to deny yourself, to take up your cross daily, and then follow me. Now, I imagine some people will be like, Phew. I was cool with watching you do a miracle, Jesus. Like, like when you, what you do with that blind guy? Like, that was crazy, right? But, like, to deny myself and take up my cross, like, when they heard that, they literally thought of the physical cross because that was a reality of that culture, right? So they knew the reality of that execution lifestyle. And they're like, man, I don't know. So what was Jesus doing? Here's what I think. I think he was taking people who were curious about him to help them take the step of commitment towards him, Right? And, and, and the reality that there's somebody in this room, maybe somebody watching online, that you've been curious about Jesus, that you've been asking questions. Maybe your friend or coworker or family member have been telling you about Jesus, and you're like, yeah, like this is kind of interesting. It seems kind of cool. We all do on Sundays or Wednesdays. That seems kind of cool. Like, a, like a, it looks awesome. And you've been curious about him. But I think the call that Jesus is wanting us to do is take a step towards commitment towards him. And what is that? How do we do that? Through denial of ourself. There's a guy in the Bible named the rich young ruler. Some of y'all know this story really well. Mark chapter 10. This guy knows the Ten Commandments. All right? Jesus tells him, you know the commandments. This guy goes up to Jesus and he asks this question. What can I do to inherit eternal life? All right? It's a powerful question. He knows Jesus has the answer. So he goes to Jesus. He runs to him literally to get the answer from Jesus, right? What can I do to inherit eternal life? He has everything in his life built up. He's got status. He's got popularity. He's rich. He has everything he needs in this world. There's one thing that he's not sure of, and that's eternal life. And he goes to the person who he knows has the answer, Jesus. So Jesus says, you know the commandments, right? Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal, right? Honor your father and mother. And he's like, I've done all those, right? Perfect kid growing up, I guess, right? He hadn't done anything wrong, right? Jesus says, you lack one thing. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. The result of that story is a rich young ruler walks away sad. Why? Because he's refused to practice the discipline of self-denial and was relying on his own stuff and his own possessions, right? And saying, this is what brings me security. And so he holds on to his stuff rather than holding on to Jesus. He walks away sad. And so my question to us today is, is what are the things that maybe you're holding on to, the things that you're trying to find delight in that you're afraid to deny? And I just think about the reality of that question, what can I do to inherit eternal life? Like you guys know what inheritance is, right? Inheritance is something that's given to you based on what? Your family line. Like when, when somebody farther down the road from you, passes away, they have some possessions, some stuff, what do they do? They, you get that as an inheritance, right? It's not dependent on what you do. It's dependent on who you belong to. 
And, and so for rich young ruler, like, like he belonged to his stuff. And Jesus was trying to get him to see that. Like, like, like you're, you're belonging to your stuff rather than belonging to me. And so inheritance is solely dependent on, you, on who you belong to. So my, my challenge as you reflect right now here in a second as we worship, as we respond, is what are the things that we are holding on to that maybe we're trying to find delight in? And what are the things that maybe we're belonging to rather than belonging to Jesus? Because as believers of Jesus, the only way we can do that is through the practice of self-denial and saying, God, I'm not going to rely on my stuff. I'm not going to rely on my works. I'm simply going to trust in the finished work of Jesus and what he did on the cross. So here's what I want to do. I want to give us an opportunity to respond this morning. Because maybe for someone in this room that you've been delighting in things that God desires for you to not delight in. And what God's calling you to do is just lay it down at the altar today. Maybe for someone in this room, you've never denied yourself and choosing to follow Jesus. So I want to give you the opportunity, right? If anyone's going to follow after me, to deny himself, take up his cross daily, and then follow me, right? And so I'm going to pray a couple of different prayers, but the first prayer I want to pray for anybody in the room is that if you have a desire to give your life to Jesus today for the very first time, I want to pray for you that maybe you are just now realizing of what Jesus did for you on the cross, of how he died and rose again, and how he desires to give us that victory, and it's through the sacrifice of Jesus that we get to have a relationship with God, and we get to be uh, have salvation for all of eternity, and maybe you've never placed your faith in Jesus. I want to pray for you. And then I'm going to pray for just people who maybe you're just walking through something difficult and you're afraid to allow that to come out. But understanding this, that we get to lay that down at the altar today and say, God, I'm just going to give this over to you and deny this reality about myself so I can delight in more of who you are. If anybody wants to believe in Jesus, I'm going to ask everyone to simply uh, bow your head and close your eyes. I want to pray for you. And if you desire to place your faith in Jesus... I just want you to pray this prayer alongside me. I want to challenge you. Let's just have a moment with God. Like maybe you came with a friend or a family member. Just have a personal moment with God for a little bit. And if you desire to place your faith in Jesus, then just say this prayer alongside me. It goes like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I confess that I am a sinner. Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross. And I believe that you rose from the grave. So Jesus, I turn from my sin and invite you into my life. I want to trust you. I want to follow you. You are my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.